I was married to someone who used to say that uh, I could turn up a pole faster than anyone <laughs> he ever knew. I don't think it's me. I think it's that uh, we recognize each other, the flag gets waved, and we are instantaneously uh, attached at the hip. When I was at Harvard, I asked myself at one point, should I change my name? And I said to myself, no, I'm not going to change my name. I'm going to na make a name for myself in spite of my name and make people learn it. But one of the norms was modesty, um, which was to work hard and to excel uh, and to be excellent, but not to be a show off, to be smart and intelligent, but not a smart aleck. Somebody had once said, you know, if there's 10 polls at a meeting, there's going to be 20 different opinions on how to do something. And that's probably true. If you look at Poland's history, Poland's history, for the most part, has not been a very pleasant or happy one. Um, involvement in a lot of wars, being taken over, being partitioned, being completely wiped, wiped off the map. Um, and it was the church that gave them some semblance of hope. It was the church where they were able to freely express themselves as Poles. When my um, husband was growing up, my father-in-law, who was from Ireland, said to him, marry a Polish girl, they're hard workers. I used to say, Mama, why don't you smile at my show? She used to say, Synek, po co ty nie po polsku? Why don't you sing in Polish, you know? And I said, Matka, co ja śpiewa? Ja nie wiem nic po angielsku, że wszystko ludzie wiemy i lubimy. And she said, well, write a song. Pisaj, pisaj ty głupie. In some ways, all immigrant stories are the same. The wrenching courage it took to leave an ancestral home for a dangerous, uncertain future, the struggles in a new land with strange customs and an even stranger language, the toil, the deprivation, the insults, and, thank God, the ultimate triumph. But our Polish-American story is different. Maybe because it is our story and because only we know it intimately. Only we have lived it, both here and there. When these Polish immigrants, right, who came to America by the millions, who were for the most part uh, small farmers, right, rural people, they did not settle in, uh, in our agricultural areas. Instead, they settled in the urban areas because um, that's where the opportunities were for, for jobs. All my four grandparents have roots in Poland. My father's parents came here as teenagers uh, to Chicopee, Mass, which is about a half hour from where we live. And there were many jobs there in the mills. There is a, a theory some people have that there were a lot of Polish Americans in the Chicopee area because people were coming to Chicago. And they thought they confused the names. They didn't here correctly or whatever and so many of them stopped there and said well here we are and there were many mills there to give them jobs and so that's why they stayed. Although we took any jobs that were available anywhere, our heart's labor was working in the fields even if the soil here was not that of our homeland. The Polish Americans came in and took up the land no one wanted. These women would go into the fields, the kids would go into the fields and take the rocks out and knock over the trees and really make use of this land. And if you go to western Massachusetts along the Connecticut River, there are so many acres and acres of farms that you will see these great Polish names on signs in front of because this is the land nobody wanted and this is what they did with it. As long as you owned a property and as long as you had your own home, it meant that no king, kaiser, or czar uh, could take it away from you. Uh, it meant um, that um, you had an asset that, uh, and home, having a home was very important uh, to the Polish people. It meant being rooted, it meant being grounded, it meant that you couldn't be pushed around. And uh, home ownership was something that you certainly couldn't do in Europe, but you could do in America. We had been pushed around for hundreds of years in the old country. 
We called the homeland Polska, but she wasn't ours really. It was a land ruled by outsiders. Yes, there were Polish villages and families, Polish language, Polish food and Polish customs, but an independent Poland was only a dream. People knew they were Poles, but they had that, a lot of that loyalty to the local area that they lived in. Once they got to the United States, people would say, uh, well, where are you from? And uh, the Americans weren't interested in that much in the local thing, but which country are you from? Well, Poland. So here they start developing kind of a national consciousness that maybe they didn't have back uh, in the 1880s and the 1890s in their own, uh, own area. Initially, the Polish immigrants did not think in terms of settling permanently in America. The idea was that they would come to America, make some money, go back, and buy land at home. In fact, this is what happened to both of my grandfathers. Both of my grandfathers came to America three times before World War I, and that was not unusual. Uh, people were going back and forth, back and forth. They worked um, in the mines, or they worked uh, in uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, they worked wherever they could make some money and make it fast. My grandfather would always tell my father that, you know, someday we'll, we'll make, he'll go back and maybe live in Poland after he gets his go business going and he'll go back and he'll live in Poland. And, at, and in the 30s, he did go back. Uh, and in, uh, he visited for a while, he came back and didn't, didn't really say much. And uh, my father asked, asked uh, him you know, why didn't he want to stay there. And he was just saying that you know, when he left, he left a, a well and a dirt floor. And when he came back to visit, maybe 20, 20 years later, there's still a well and a dirt floor. America was where we came to earn some money, money to purchase a life for ourselves in impoverished Poland. A few dairy cows, perhaps, and a small farm near Poznań. There was a very interesting song that was being sung by not only the mountaineers, but Polish immigrants in general. And it's called Góralu Trzecinie Żal, meaning that, a mountaineer, aren't you sorry that you are leaving your beautiful mountain, you know, homeland? And the Góral would answer, Yes, yes, for bread, because, because I have to find bread to eat, I have to leave my homeland. This is a song that uh, Polish Americans uh, We'll sing. It's almost like a drinking song, too. <laughs> Very slowly, a strange thing began to happen. We realized that our freedom, which had been a dream in Poland, could be made a reality right here. We held our futures in our own powerful hands. I don't think that there is a Pole that I've ever met who wasn't capable of whoop, putting on the rubber, rubber gloves, digging in, and, um, and participating. Uh, uh, the sense of work and the, the, the work ethic and the sense of, the, of uh, being happy, having accomplished something is, I think, very much a part of the Polish psyche. Dad worked from right from the very bottom. He was nothing but an ordinary worker on a railroad. He walked four miles to his job and he walked four miles back. And then he put in an eight-hour day. There were jobs on top of jobs, and my, my grandfather worked in the wire mill that no longer exists in town. My other grandfather, Strumpek, worked in the tire mill where my father worked for 37 years. And so they had all this going on top of like a small farm at home, and then maybe something else to keep them busy around town. When my grandfather, Joseph, had died in 1935, um, you know, obviously my grandmother, who had three young children, needed to, to work. And because of all her in-laws had worked at American Steel and Wire, she was going to work at American Steel and Wire. And in fact, uh, she did for a number of years work over there. And my mother would tell, would tell me the stories on how, how bloody and red and, and her, her hands were, because she had to wind all this, this wire. 
and that was hard work and it would, it would you know there'd be little I guess filaments of the of the metal that would dig into her skin and it was just she said it was just horrible horrible work these Polish workers in the refineries who hardly could speak uh, English very well uh, they struck and um, they had to get a translator from Ellis Island to come over there and translate their demands and one of the demands was that they be treated with, uh, with dignity. It's funny that they didn't put as one of their first demands that they wanted higher wages or, no, they wanted, they wanted to be treated with greater dignity. If anything was greater or more important than our capacity to work, it was our faith in one another, in the future, and above all, in our God. When my ancestors came, one of the first things that they did was gather themselves together with their fellow Pauls and begin to discuss the building of a church, somewhere where they could worship God in their language, somewhere where their customs that they brought with them from their native land could be continued and passed on to their children who are now being born in this land. Uh, whether that was here in New York or in Chicago or even uh, in a place like San Antonio, Texas, which is the site of the first Polish-American community. This church that we're sitting in, I take great pride in because it was my great-grandfather who, at the turn of the century, went to the bishop of this diocese and asked for permission to have a Polish church built where the people of this area could worship in their own language and where they could carry on the customs that they brought over with them from their native land. Obviously, the bishop granted him permission. He didn't have any struggle or opposition, and this parish has been in existence since 1913. You identified yourself as a parishioner, St. Joseph's. I'm a parishioner of St. Joseph's Church. Uh, if you were living in another part of the city, well, then you were a parishioner <laughs> of, another, of another church. Every Polish uh, Roman Catholic church also had a parochial school. So this is something uh, rather unique about the, uh, about the Polish Americans is that they expended a lot of their resources on not only building magnificent churches. Why magnificent? Partly because of religious feelings, but also partly for status. The greater the church, the bigger the church, the greater the status of the community. The church really was the center of the community. That's where the societies grew out of. There's a St. Stanislaus Society in our town that went down the street and opened a big hall, which is where all the, the um, social events would take place. And my mother, my, my grandparents were married in our church. My, my parents were married in our church. I was married in our church. And we all had our receptions down at the Polish Hall down the street, which is sort of, if you've seen the movie The Deer Hunter, it's that kind of a deal with the stage where you have your big polka band playing and, and everybody's sort of crowding in there and it's just wonderful. Most of the uh, Poles coming over to the United States uh, were not highly educated. Um, my great-grandmother, for example, had completed the sixth grade in Poland, which was considered quite an accomplishment for a woman of her, of her day. So the priest was the one who was the most highly educated, so he became uh, their doctor, their lawyer, their financial advisor, their confidant on all levels of life, because he would have been the one with the most academic background and training. So they turned to him for everything. Receptive as she was to us, America could not have become our true home if we continued to speak only our old world language. When you met a fellow, uh, really, your parents were hoping that he was Polish. <laughs> and my grandmother always thought that everybody was Polish, that there was nobody else but Polish people. So if you brought in a fellow that wasn't Polish and he spoke just English, my grandmother says, well, because he doesn't want to speak Polish, but he is Polish. See, that's, that's the thought that was there. You're Polish and that's it. We had to learn our English, but we didn't want to lose our Polish in the process. Our schools helped us do both. What was so important about the Polish and parochial schools was they were bilingual. They were the bridge between the old world and the new world. In the mornings we would speak in Polish and then in the afternoon we would speak in, uh, 
in English. So this was really truly bilingual, a bilingual school. And the fact that I, I can still speak some Polish today is largely due to the fact, well, of course, that I spoke Polish uh, to my parents, but also because of the instruction that we got in, uh, in these parochial schools. I remember as a child when uh, we were in the classroom and the priest walked in, all the children would immediately jump to their feet. So you just shot to your feet and you would recite this little thing, praise be Jesus Christ. To which he would reply forever and ever, amen. You just couldn't imagine that the priest was you know, coming to see your class and then to give out the report cards and each boy would receive sort of a tap on the face as he got his and each girl would get sort of like a pinch and then the rest of the day you kind of carried his aftershave around with you then just like, gosh, the priest gave me my report card. And, you know, whether or not it was good was another thing, but that was a great thrill. We had a Polish prince, who, I mean a Polish priest who really ran the school, the parish, and I, I'm just sorry we don't have more priests today like Father Zielong. He was tough. Boy, I'll tell you what, he would speak in mass. Everybody came. Nobody wanted to miss church because they knew he knew you weren't there. And he would know if you weren't there. And uh, I remember one time uh, we went to confession where we all say our sins and uh, I must have been in the sixth or seventh grade, and Eddie Vishniewski was ahead of me. And he, m -m 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 -m, he said his sins, and I heard Father Jello say, You did what? And I got so scared and nervous. I'm, until today, I'm trying to figure out what could Eddie Vishniewski have done in the seventh grade that would disturb him as much as he was disturbed. I mean, I thought he was going to throw him out of there. A gruff, demanding Polish priest is a memory that stays with many of us, fondly. We were most comfortable in our church and we saw it similar feelings on the streets outside its walls. We were the third house in from East 71st Street, and here is the street from the very first house, the Gluskis, Wierzbickis, Koniszewiczes, Sobczynskis, Wapuszynskis, Kowalskis, Drabeks, Bednarskis, Koniszewicz, my grandparents, uh, Bichel, Okrzeszewski, uh, I think there were some Stipple families that, that had lived at the other house. I mean, it just goes on and on. And, I mean, it kind of went around the bend, and those I really didn't know those people as, as well. But I'm sure they had ski names, beach names, or some Polish names. The Polish immigrants, in a sense, what they did was to recreate uh, their villages uh, in this country. So sometimes they are referred to as urban villagers. They actually recreated their own villages in the heart of our great cities. What I liked uh, so much about the Polish community is it was like a village. We, we lived worked, worshipped, and shopped all within walking distance. This was our community. I mean, we had the butchers were here, the hairdressers were here, the barbers were here, the department stores were here. Everything was right here in this little ethnic community of Warsaw. I mean, that's the name of it. It's still known as Warsaw.